Hey everyone, welcome back to my tabletop studio. Today we're going to be talking about light. So this is a video I've been wanting to make for a really long time because it's one of my most requested subjects. But before I got to making it, I had to sit down and have a think about how I wanted to approach this material. And the more I thought about it, the more my mind kind of went to my own journey with cooking. Now, to give you some backstory, when I moved out of my parents' house, I knew hardly anything about cooking. Like I had no skills, didn't know how to use equipment, didn't know how to work with ingredients or how to combine flavors. And if I had a step-by-step -step recipe, I could follow that and get okay results, but I never knew sort of why the recipes were put together the way they were. And then a few years ago, I was surfing on YouTube looking for quick and dirty recipe videos um, either because I wanted to get rid of some leftovers in the fridge or because I wanted to make emergency drunk food but whatever the case was I landed on a channel called Brothers Green Eats and what they did was they did have these really quick and simple recipes but they would also explain along the way why you were doing things that certain way. So why were you using these ingredients? Why are you using this combination of flavors? And they also taught you how to be able to get creative with the stuff that you had. And I thought that was just really inspiring and valuable because they got more into the theory behind cooking while also giving you a little bit of step-by-step -step instruction. So for this video, I don't want to just walk you through a bunch of lighting setups and say this is the way you should set up you know this kind of shot what I want to do is to show you a little bit of that but also kind of get more into how to look at light and how to understand the way that it behaves so with that in mind I want to walk you through five tips on how you can start to work with and understand light so my first tip involves thinking about light. Now when most people think about light, they're probably picturing a quantized excitation of the electromagnetic field which exhibits both wave-like and particle-like properties. Or a light bulb. Now, you're probably thinking of this light bulb as a central point from where light rays radiate out in all directions. And that's a pretty good approximation when the source of your light is very small. But what happens when you have a very large light source? Before we get into it, there is one really important concept I want you to be able to visualize, and that is the relative apparent size of your light source compared to your subject. So what I mean by that is how big is your light going to look from the subject's point of view when you take distance into account. So to help you visualize that, I've set up a miniature LED light here and an Android, and they're both about the same size. And then I've used these plastic rails to trace the line from the edge of the nendoroid to the edge of the light. And you can see that when they're close together, it's going to sweep out a pretty wide angle. So that means from the nendoroid's point of view, this light's going to be looking pretty big. But now when I move this light further back, and then I adjust the rails to again trace from the outside edge of the nendoroid, to the outside edges of the light. You can see that it sweeps out a much smaller angle. So it's a way of demonstrating the pretty obvious fact that you know when you take something and you move it further away, it's gonna look smaller, thanks to the laws of perspective. But this is actually gonna be a really important thing to keep in mind when you're working with lights and light modifiers. Because the apparent size of your light source is gonna be what controls the quality of the light you get. So that's going to determine how soft or hard your shadows are. Now that we have that bit of terminology out of the way, you remember what I said about that picture of the light bulb as a central point with all the light rays coming outwards from it. I said that that wasn't a very good approximation if you have a light source that's large relative to your subject. So I'm going to demonstrate that here with the video light and a piece of white paper so that you can see what's going on with the shadows. So now that I have the light pretty close to the figure, if the light bulb approximation was true, uh, regardless of the distance, then you would imagine that this is your center point 
and then the light rays are coming in all different directions from there. And then you wouldn't have any light rays wrapping around the figure this way, so what you would expect to see is a well-defined shadow. But instead what we do see is that there's a gradient to the shadow, it's a soft one. But now when I move my light source further back, you can see that the shadow is becoming much better defined. And that's because now the amount of light rays wrapping around this figure is a lot lower. So what you have are more parallel light rays and they give that harder edge to the shadow. So that's the difference that the apparent size of your light source makes. So you can change that by either getting a physically larger light or taking your light and moving it closer or further away. So we saw that this idea of a light bulb acting as a single point of origin and then all the light rays coming out from there, which photographers, they call that a bear bulb, by the way. But we saw that this model isn't really valid when you have a large light emitting surface that's close to the figure. So how should you think about light? I move the camera to the figure's point of view and then you can see on this video light that the light isn't coming from one single point. It's actually coming from a grid of LEDs. And each of those LEDs is acting like a little light bulb, and those are sending out light in all different directions. So when you have a large light emitting surface, you can just think of it as just a really big version of this video light, and each of the little points on that surface you can think of as like these LEDs. So the reason why if you take a large light source and you hold it close to your subject, the reason why you get nice soft shadows and that wraparound lighting is because you can see that more surfaces on the subject are going to be exposed to light coming from these oblique angles here. But then if I move the video light further back, now you can see that the apparent size is smaller and you're not going to be able to get as much wraparound because the light rays coming from these edges aren't going to be able to make it all the way to some of these surfaces that are further away. So all that stuff I just talked about is what I meant in my previous video when I was talking about kind of the fundamental principle of lighting for photography. It's this idea that if the apparent size of your light source is large, then you're going to get soft lighting and soft shadows. And if the apparent size of your light source is small, then you're going to get hard light and harder edges on your shadows. So that was my very, very long first tip on how to work with light. So let's move on to number two. My second tip is to not feel constrained to just use one light. And if you do use more lights, don't feel like they all have to be pointing at the figure. So I've come back to my super basic figure photography setup because I'm gonna practice what I preach and remove any kind of visual clutter from this shot. So right now we're starting with just a single light setup. And what I've done is put this lamp on my light stand. Usually there would be a flash here, but for video I need to use a lamp. And it's shining through this umbrella. And then this umbrella is going to scatter all of that light and create a very, very diffuse light that's going to go on the figure and give it some soft shadows and a little bit of shading. And then remember what we talked about in the first tip which is the apparent size of your light source. So from the figure's point of view, this umbrella is gonna be a very, very large light source. The angle that I have it set up here is gonna cast a little bit of shadow on one side of the figure's face. And this is kind of analogous to Rembrandt lighting when you do portraiture. And it's about having part of the face just a little bit shaded. And that gives like a nice sense of depth to the figure. So now we've nailed down a pretty good basic look using just one light. And I think this is a good target to aim for if you're just starting out in lighting. But from here, what I like to do is add in some more lights to kind of get creative, add little accents to the shot. And when I do that, I like to first think about what's gonna be the brightest light source in the shot. So in this case, that's our umbrella again. And that's gonna be what's called our key light. On my previous video, I talked a little bit about how if you don't like those shadows on the part of the figure, what you can do is just add in a second light to fill that in, and that's the fill light. You don't have to use that second light 
right in front of the figure to fill in shadows all the time. Another thing you can do with a two light setup is to take your second light and put it behind the figure and across from your key light. What that's going to do is create a little accent. You can see that little outline on the left side of the figure. And that's called rim lighting and this is a cross lit setup. So here we have our video light that's acting as the rim light but then most of the figure is still going to be lit by this umbrella. So this is also a pretty common setup in portraiture. From here if you wanted to add a third light a really common place to aim it would be the backdrop. So now you have a backlight. Since I don't have anything in my backdrop, all it's doing is kind of blowing out this white piece of paper. But sometimes if you're shooting in front of like a diorama or an interesting part of your room or out in the environment, the background is going to look a lot darker than the figure itself. So in that case, you would need a backlight to kind of even out the exposure and make everything look like it's roughly the same brightness. There's another thing you can do with a three light setup, and this one's a personal favorite of mine. That's just to use these for two rim lights. Let me pull out and show you what this looks like. Rim lighting is something that I really struggled with, and even though I tried to follow along with the info that I could find on the internet, it wasn't really working for me. I didn't get the results that I wanted. And then one day I saw a figure um, that I had displayed in front of just a white wall. And the wall was kind of just reflecting the room light onto the figure, but I noticed that it wrapped around in this really cool way. So when I got back to my tabletop studio, I tried to just take two very large light sources and I set them behind the figure facing forward. And then you can see that this kind of setup is what's creating that really nice wraparound with the bright accents on the sides. So you're going to want your rim lights to be brighter actually than your key light. From here we can go straight into my four light setup and you're never going to guess where that fourth light is going to go. Yep, it's a backlight. This is actually the setup that I use the most often nowadays on my tabletop studio. Normally I would just have some reflective material taped to the wall behind all of this so that when the backlight hits it, it gives you some really cool out of focus sparkles and it also helps to light up um, any like props that you might have in the scene. Usually I stop at four lights because there's only so much space on my tabletop. It can get a little bit difficult managing that many lights and uh, well, lights ain't free. If I'm shooting multiple figures and I really need to even out some shaded areas, then I'll add in a reflector. And by the way, this is just a piece of white foam core board. If you're lighting on the budget, this is really going to be your best friend because you can just cut out a big chunk of it and use that to bounce light wherever you need it. So I really like this setup for my standard look because you have the two rim lights bringing out the little details all over your figure. And then you only have one light that's pointed directly at the front of your figure so you still get a little bit of shading and depth. And then you can use the backlight to make the background a little more interesting. So I think this is a good target to aim for. But at the same time, don't let me stop you from using more than four lights if you want to. I'm working within certain constraints, but that doesn't mean you have to. All right, now that I've shown you a little bit about studio lighting, let's head outside and I can give you some tips about working with natural light. Ah, shit. Tip number three is about lighting your Nendoroid playsets. So I'm gonna use Luluco here, who looks absolutely thrilled to be helping me out. Now when I first started photographing Nendoroids on playsets, I would light them kind of like the way you see here. So I have just an umbrella on the right side here as my key light. And it's causing this very even lighting, which would look good with a scale figure, but at Nendoroid size, it's kind of not able to bring out as much detail as I would like on the image. And it, so what happens is it makes the picture kind of flat and boring looking. Now, what I would love is to be able to get a bunch of small practical lights. Um, 
I'm talking about are like props that would actually have built-in LEDs that light up. But I don't have any of those. I mean, I have like this lamp, but it's not an actual light. It doesn't light up. But then I thought about other ways that I could possibly light this type of scene. And I thought about how in portraiture, a lot of the times people will use natural light by a window. And it adds a little bit of drama to the scene. And I thought about why that would be the case. So let me show you what I settled on. So I'm turning off the umbrella. Now I'm gonna turn on the window light. So what we can do now is fill in the right part of the image. And I'm actually just going to use my umbrella again, but I'm gonna turn it way down. I moved the camera a bit to place us closer to the scene and to give you a look at the window light. So my LED light bank is just outside the window right here. Now we can see that this scene looks a little more visually interesting because we've got some contrast and we've got some shadows. And it gets to a quote that I read once about lighting and photography. And it said that good lighting is really about making interesting shadows. And this sort of natural light look is really good for that. And from the reverse angle, you can see a little more of what this light setup is doing. So before when we had the light coming in from the front and from the top down, the scene looked very flat. But now we have the light going across and it's creating these cool shadows on the wall and the floor. And the way I went about recreating this kind of natural light look was to just think about how the window light looked as it came into my own apartment. And I saw that because the window kind of restricts the angles that the light can come in, you don't get super soft lighting, but it is highly directional. So the takeaway here is that because Nendoroids are so much smaller than scale figures and that the level of detail is different, you need to approach lighting them differently. The key is really to embrace contrast and shadows. Now, I'm not an expert at Nendoroid photography and there are way more experienced Nendoroid photographers than me. So I would encourage you to look for them, check out their lighting setups and see what you can learn from them. But if you only have a couple of lights and you want to, to be honest, spend minimal effort, then this is a pretty good starting point and you can get a pretty natural look that's going to fit a wide variety of images. We're not going to need demos for my last two tips because they're more about the creative mindset. So my fourth tip is to be on the lookout for good light. Always follow the light. So if you're walking around in the city or if you're just out in the woods or even if you're at home, pay attention to the scene around you and see if light is falling on anything in a cool way. And if you see something that's lit in an interesting way, take a mental note of it or even better, pull out your phone and take a snapshot. Now, I'm not even talking about figures necessarily, it can be anything. It can be the landscape, it can be the sky, it can be a building or a person. It's going to teach you what good light looks like and it's going to teach you certain looks that you can aim to recreate in your studio. So following along with that is my last tip, which has been a running theme in this video, which is to try to put yourself in your subject's point of view. So when you do see something that's lit up in a cool way, Try to put yourself where that subject is and think about the light sources that's causing it to look cool. Look at the size and shape of those light sources, see if they're reflecting off of anything, and see if they're picking up any color casts. Once you have that kind of info, you'll be able to start to reproduce that look in a more controlled environment, and then you can start to get creative with your own lighting setups. Now I've just given you a whole bunch of stuff to think about, and that's without even getting into lighting for outdoors. And I'm gonna save that for when I'm actually outside doing a photo shoot. But for now, I hope that these lighting tips have given you the building blocks that you can use to start playing around with and exploring light. Photography is really about the capture of light. So it's really important to understand how it works so that you can improve your photos. Now there's a whole lot that I haven't covered. So if you have any questions or if you have anything else that you want me to expand on, go ahead and let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, give me a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, and if you haven't already, check me out on Instagram. I'm posting pictures there 
pretty much every day and every once in a while I might have something intelligent to say. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.